Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Kowali Days 2013 in beautiful San Diego. Isn't it gorgeous? I'm Jennifer Foudy. I'm the executive director of the Kowali Foundation, and it really gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you here. Um, we've been doing Kowali Days for quite a while now, and it gets bigger every year. For those of you who are newcomers this year, I think you attended a really packed newcomer session last night. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that you're going to learn a lot here at Kowali Days. Um, by the numbers, so there's a lot of you here. This is a nice big room. Um, I actually, in the last hour, got an update. We're now 888, 888 attendees. So whichever one of you walked in the last hour, thank you. Um, but I think even more uh, impressing or exciting for me is the number of institutions and organizations represented, 137 from 37 U.S. states and Puerto Rico, and the number of countries we have here, too. Um, and we have a large contingent from South Africa as well as the UK, and I was pleased to see one of our Japanese friends join us, too. So hope to meet you soon while you're here. You probably wonder what the little blonde chopsticks are. They're not drumsticks, for those of you who are musically inclined. They are chopsticks to go along with our theme of koali. Um, and what we're really excited about this year, it's the 1.0 release of the open library environment, Koali Olay. <laughs> We love our librarians, and they've done a fantastic job of getting this release out in time to be announced today. So congratulations, team. I know I'm going to put you on the spot, but all the Olay people, please stand, and let's do one more round of applause for Koali Olay team. And of course, like all projects, we expect good things to come. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to the very important person, Sarah Kristen from Cornell University, who is our Kuali Days Conference Chair, and she has done an outstanding job in pulling this together over the past nine months. And so let's give her a big welcome and hear more about what's to come. Thank you, and I want to welcome everyone, welcome everyone to Quality Days uh, 2013. I hope you've been having a wonderful time since you arrived. I hope you're meeting lots of people and getting your questions answered, and I hope you're finding people whose questions you can answer. Um, I hope you're enjoying collaborating with colleagues from other schools, and if I can help find something or someone to help answer your questions, please don't hesitate to ask. The theme for this year's conference is building momentum through community, and I think that says it all. Kuali is growing, our momentum is growing, our community is growing, and our applications are growing. There are 888 of us here today for this conference. That's 70 people more than we had at last year's Kuali Days conference, and hundreds more than we had at the first Kuali Days conference in 2005 when we had just 120 attendees. Today, we have 137 different organizations here, including schools and vendors. At that first conference, we had six. This is the kind of momentum I'm talking about. Um, and it comes from the people, it comes from the community, and it comes from collaboration and hard work. This is a community who is focused on keeping our money and our mission, keeping our administrative costs low so that we can focus on our students and our research. We all know that in higher education institutions, we each have our own special challenges and problems. But we also have a lot in common. Why not work together to solve those problems? If you've been to many Quality Days conferences, you know about the momentum I'm talking about because you've watched it grow over the years. If you're new to Kuali, welcome, and let us help you get acquainted with our applications and our community. I know you will find this community to be as welcoming and helpful as I have. This is a community who is always looking for new ideas, new friends, and new partners to help make Kuali better for higher education. This is my fifth Kuali Days conference, and with each year I've been involved with these people and this organization, I've learned more. I'm constantly amazed at this community's ability to take on new challenges, to solve problems, and to build better solutions for higher education. Um, when we work together, we are really, really strong. While you're here in San Diego, 
Um, I hope you take advantage of all we have to offer with this conference, starting by downloading our mobile app. The mobile app will, will tell you up-to-date information about our sessions. It'll give you information about our presenters, uh, conference attendees, there's maps. Um, anything you need to know about the conference is in that app. Yesterday, we had 15 pre-conference sessions. This is more pre-conference sessions than we've ever had before, and there's more pre-conference attendees than we've ever had. Um, starting today and through midday on Thursday, we'll have over 160 um, individual sessions, ranging in topics for technical folks, for functional folks. We have um, information on trying to, uh, for those who are trying to understand the economics of Kuali, and for those who are trying to better utilize our applications. I guarantee there's something for everybody in these sessions. We have eight tracks, each having a separate track chair, so that, so that the track is um, diverse for all the attendees. We also have an executive track for those trying to get a higher level view of our products and projects. Later today, we're offering two consecutive portfolio sessions where you can learn all about each of the applications. At these sessions, there's, we have the experts of each application giving um, a, a presentation and available to answer any questions you might have. Be sure to check out our user experience um, sessions as well. The user experience project is, an, is a new project this year. Um, there's a lot of momentum and a lot of ex excitement about this. Um, we're focused on creating a better user experience for all of the quality applications. Um, be sure to check that out. If you're a newcomer, we have ambassadors who are happy to help show you around. If you attended our newcomer session last night, you saw how many newcomers are here, here this week. Um, it was really crowded. If you um, were meant to meet an ambassador during that session and you never did, and you're still trying to find that person, let me know. I can probably help you find them. Um, finally, this evening, we have the Collaboration Showcase. Um, this is an opportunity to see what our KCAs are doing and an opportunity to see what other, what other schools are doing. Our Collaboration Showcase is an opportunity for anyone um, who wants to show new developments and projects they're working on. Being the conference chair this year has been an amazing experience for me. Having the opportunity to work with these great people and plan this event has been a lot of fun. So I want to take this opportunity to thank the conference committee. Can all of you guys stand up so that we can give you a quick hand? These are the people that make this happen every year. I also want to make sure to thank the track chairs. These are the folks that make sure we have a diverse and complete program in each of the tracks. Um, they're, ve they're a very integral part of the planning. Can these folks stand up as well? Thank you. So before we move on with our, pro with our main program, I'd like to thank our plenary session sponsor, Laserfish. Since 1987, Laserfish has used its Run Smarter philosophy to create simple and elegant enterprise content management solutions. And as you're walking out today, there's some booklets on Laserfish. Be sure to grab one as you leave. I also want to thank our, the rest of our conference sponsors. Um, sponsors are an integral part of our conference and also of the Kuali community. Be sure to stop by the Collaboration Showcase this evening and learn more about them. And now I'd like to introduce Brad Wheeler, the Quali Foundation Board Chair and Vice President of Information Technologies and Chief Information Officer at Indiana University. Brad is going to um, moderate our distinguished panel discussion this morning. Welcome and good morning. I want to uh, practice and see if everybody can repeat after me. So listen carefully and repeat this. Ding. Can you do that? Do it. Try it. OK. That's the sound of a bell. So when you hear someone at Kuali Days and they're saying something that sounds roughly like this, um, <clears throat> uh, let's see if we can give a, a good example. Uh, KS has a new PDT that's coordinating with the SMEs to deliver KSAP. <laughs> okay, now that's a normal sentence for many people <laughs> around here. Okay, so what your response will be is ding, unpack those acronyms that that would be Kowali students has a new development team that is working with the subject matter experts to get the quality academic planner out the door, quality student academic planner. So we'll use the word ding when you hear an acronym speak too much around here that says, whoa, 
English, unpack that, and here we go. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce a very distinguished panel who will be talking to you about their choices, their institution, and the, the path that they have been on in making investments and implementing Kuali. So I'll let each of them uh, introduce themselves in turn. We'll start with Mike, and then I'm gonna sit down and join them for a little unscripted Q&A. Thanks, Brad. Uh, my name is Mike Allred. I serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Finance and Campus Controller at UC Davis. Good morning, Lynn Johnson, Chief Financial Officer at Colorado State University. I'm Deborah Jacobs. I'm the Vice Provost for Library Affairs at Duke University and co-chair of the Kuali Ole Board. Hi, I'm Mike Burke from Boston College where I'm the Vice President for IT and the Chief Information Officer. So let's get right to it. Each of you is a senior administrator. You hold a very important role at your institution in helping to move it forward. So I'd like to know what was your personal calculus? As an executive, you're often thinking about where am I going to put my passion behind and drive through and champion something and how will that reflect on me? So I'd like to talk just a moment. What was your personal calculus in deciding to take your institution and champion this direction? And I want to start with Mike because he came in very early before Kuali Financial had even put out a release, as I recall, or it may have been a dot, dot, dot something release. Right. In fact, Brad, we were involved uh, in 2001, 2002 in the Big Ten Consortium discussions about uh, moving forward, and we decided that uh, we needed to do it on our own, and we went about that, and before long, a series of budget crises has hit the state of California, and we needed a partner to share the cost of a new financial system, frankly, and so that was the calculation for us. How do we minimize the cost to replace a system that had only been in place eight or nine years? Yeah, but was and as, as I recall, um, Kuali Financial had launched with six investors, uh, some investment from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Uh, we were not really looking to onboard more at the time. We had enough to figure out on our own. And Mike, at the University of California Davis campus, championed campus and University of California system office right. investment, came in with a million dollar investment. So I want you to talk a little bit about the role you played, the risk you may have perceived, and how that went down. Well, the risk for us was, we, on the one hand, we had a financial system that was written in Uniface that we couldn't support and we couldn't modify and was not working for a campus. Uh, and Kuali, uh, what was going to be Kuali, was very similar in terms of GL and chart of accounts to what we had now, very similar to what Indiana University had. So that seemed to minimize some of the risk. Um, the University of California had underinvested in technology for many, many years and was searching for a replacement financial system. So in talking to this with the leadership at OP, uh, their thinking was, gee, a quarter million dollars in cash on our part, you guys contribute the FTE, the other three campuses. Um, that's, that's an easy decision to make, count us in. So that worked out really well. We've had a change in leadership that is at, at UC now that is pursuing some other options, but I think uh, we're still on the right track. Davis is up and running in KFS. UC Irvine is, is coming up in a few months, so uh, things are looking good. So now you look like the smart guy. I don't know about that. We, <laughs> but, uh, we did it at a very low cost compared to what Vended Solutions are costing universities of our size. Okay, now Lynn, I know you look like the smart woman at Colorado State University now since you guys were the first big institution to go live. As the CFO there, can you talk a little bit about some of the forces of which way you were going to go and how you thought about spending your personal political capital on this unproven idea? So. Um, I may be revealing some secrets that Brad doesn't know about me, but when we were looking at Kuali the first time through, I was actually the director of sponsored programs at Colorado State University. And our look at Kuali was actually being driven by our controller at the time. And he had sent out an individual out to Kuali Days to go out, understand what's going on, and come back with some reasons as to why we should not go down the Kuali path. <laughs> and that individual, many of you here may know who that is, and that was Troy Fluharty. And yes. Troy came back yes. to the controller at the time and said, I can't do it. I can't tell you a reason <laughs> as to why we should not be going down the direction of looking at Kuali very seriously. 
And um, so we had just gone through an RFI with SAP and Banner and PeopleSoft and found that we had a lot of gaps. And when Troy came back and said, we ought to be looking at Kuali, that was the starting point. And at that point in time, the research area was looking at a replacement for a homegrown system. And I personally got engaged at going to Kuali Days. And I remember coming back thinking I should be walking in a parade with a banner that said, Kuali, Kuali, because I heard <laughs> Brad speak the first time. And I knew that he was the Pied Piper. And that was the direction we should go. Um, being in the research side, I sat and watched our faculty members collaborate across this country in pulling great research projects together that benefited mankind. I didn't see, a, I, when I saw that and I saw what the quality community brought to the table, it was about time that the administrative side of the university began following suit with our faculty members and collaborating and making the realm in which we operate and provide services to our campus the best that we can. So from my perspective, it felt like home. Yeah, there is a difference between our, our first two speakers and our next two because they have implemented, they were investors in Kuali Financial and, and so they're, they've gone live and they look real smart right now. And our other two presenters up here, their projects are still in the oven and still, uh, yeah, move. So uh, they're just in a time uh, way. This is a different part of the life cycle of a project. So I'm going to jump over to Mike because student was one of the next projects. And proportionately, uh, if we think of the financial system, you know, as this big and you know maybe the library system is something about like that you know the student system is this big it's it's really really a big complicated enchilada so mike why don't you talk about some of your thoughts of making the argument and choices to lead there uh, at your institution sure so i i'd like to go back to the first word you used personal calculus personal so, calculus so for me it was like calculus and i'm an engineering major and i spent a lot of bad hours doing calculus but we at boston college we we are let's say a very conservative organization and my job as but, a but cio he, he does have a data center with stained glass windows and it is beautiful may i add <laughs> okay keep going and we, we're very conservative by nature, and as a CIO, my job is to you know, maintain reliable, stable systems that the university can run on and prosper, but at the same time, try to push for innovation. And you know, Kuali seemed like a potentially innovative idea, but however, uh, I think you're aware, I came out of the software industry, mm -hmm. so I've had a lot of experience with big packaged applications, SAP, Oracle's eBusiness Suite, and even at Boston College, uh, Oracle's PeopleSoft product. So the university had started looking at things and in 2008, 2009 timeframe was very serious about putting in a vendor package. But then a little fiscal reality hit in that fall with the downturn of the stock market and the endowment. So we had to really take a serious look at things from a different perspective. We had a, so we looked at the opportunities with the vendors. We looked at the opportunities of doing it our own with Kuali. Every other opportunity was out there from every angle, from the fiscal uh, issues, from the technology issues, from the long range viability, the licensing, the intellectual capital. And thankfully, we had a great team on board at Boston College that was able to take us through that and really build the case to the trustees that we have a better prospect for a system that is going to serve our university well with Kuali a system that is in the process of being built with all the inherent risk, but all the upside potential versus the alternatives that weren't even designed this century, that were designed in the last century. So the, full, the upside potential was there, and we saw the risk of Kuali diminishing over time. Yeah, I'm going to comment on students. So of the eight Kuali projects, some of them began in very similar ways. So the financial system started with the baseline design that had been proven to work at Indiana University for our small campuses and our large campuses. We've got eight campuses, Nakubo had looked at it, and it needed to be brought forward to a new technology and some improvements. Likewise, research administration began with the COIUS, the MIT COIUS system, and then it was brought forward. Student system started with saying, we don't really want to create your father's Oldsmobile and bring it forward. 
we want to think about a student services system that really is next generation thinking. So it started from a blank piece of paper in designing, not the automation of the registrar and the automation of the bursar, but what would a student services system need to be? It was a bigger and harder project, so I appreciate you calling out the upside of achieving it as well as the risks mm -hmm. of a large software project. Now, Deborah, the library project had a long history a little bit before it landed in Kuali, and then you became the chair of the board and, and leader of it. So talk a little bit about your role and decision of how that all unfolded for libraries. Sure, I was sitting here trying to remember step by step the history. It feels kind of like a snowball that just carried <laughs> us along because we were contacted at Duke about, I don't know, six years ago, seven years ago by the Mellon Foundation and asked to lead uh, an inquiry, an initiative, uh, to look at what a system built by libraries, uh, designed by librarians uh, for an integrated library system would look like. In other words, what would it take to break out of uh, the commercial uh, world? Um, because we've, for years we've been accepting and working with a decreasing number of vendors' products, yep. which require a lot of workarounds and don't quite mesh with, with our systems. So we were, um, we were offered this opportunity to coordinate with a, a nice grant from Mellon, uh, an international look at what libraries actually need. Um, when that was completed, of course, we were so excited about the potential that we said, well, we want to uh, move this forward, so Andrew Mellon again, our patron saint, we are so grateful for the support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in so many ways. Um, and uh, we put together the year one proposal, we gathered some partners, uh, we have a really diverse group of partners, and then we um, were awarded the funds, we committed funds of our own, and we were looking for a home and a kindred community, and that's how we landed with Kuali. Yeah, as I recall, that was an interesting time period because it had a long incubation cycle. Uh, like most things in libraries. Uh, <laughs> it had a long incubation cycle, <laughs> and uh, the librarians had really done their homework. They had conducted many workshops, that report's available, and uh, trying to understand what do libraries need and where the world is going. And th they had talked to us a little bit in the quality community, but they really were pretty much on a journey saying, we got this one, uh, we're good, you know, and heading on down a path of saying they were gonna you know, build software and kind of their own organization. And as they thought about it a bit more, they thought, you know, uh, while library systems are different than those other big administrative thingies that you're doing over there, you know, you guys have figured out a number of things, like, you know, how you do the money and how you run a software mm -hmm. project and how you run a functional council. And librarians, you know, said, let's have a chat. And one thing led to another, and I believe we were in, uh, where San Antonio, as I recall, was where we announced that the library project had received the Mellon grant to go forward with the software build and get started. So now that such an obvious outcome has happened in libraries, I assume you have hundreds of members on board? Uh, hundreds of members with Koali Olay? Yeah. Uh, not quite, not yet. But, <laughs> not but yet. When, well, but, I was... when, but after Lehigh and Chicago uh, go live, there will be people flocking to us because they're, you know, librarians are a cautious bunch. They, uh, <laughs> they, they tend you know, to have a little some caution. Some of us are more pioneering than others, let's just put it that way. Yeah. So even after Deborah and her library colleague investors, including uh, uh, a number, you can see the roster, I won't name them all, and a consortium in Florida as well, decided to do this. They put their money in. They've been meeting. The 1.0 software release is, is out. 1.5 is coming. The first two uh, institutions, University of Chicago, an amazing a library of Judy Nadler there and uh, Lehigh will be going live next July. There's still a bit of caution in that community of just yet to see if you've proven yourself to have taken a good risk. Is that fair? I think so, yeah. I mean, librarians take the long view and uh, I think there are a number of people who are naysayers in our world. Uh, you know, they would rather just follow the tried and true and 
you know, oppressive commercial products. <laughs> but that's okay, you know. Um, if that's what, but I, I think we're, you know, we'll open a lot of eyes when we go live and people already have seen the press release and I've been getting some emails this morning. So, you know, I, I mean, I, I think there was a certain, oh, they could never really do this. It would be a really great thing if they could, but, you know, we're not sure. And I should also add, uh, Deborah is the incoming chair of the Association of Research Libraries for uh, the next year, which is a, a major, very three huge. Years, three years, vice president, president, and past president. Past president. So, so she's I got get a, another she, three years. She'll have a, a megaphone sentenced. she can speak from uh, <laughs> uh, in doing that. One other thing about the Put library small, project that small. I think is particularly important for our keep your money in your mission, I had no idea that a library system needed a financial system inside it. And there's a lot of stuff libraries do that are very, very financially oriented. And so what the librarians said is, we don't want to spend our library dollars building that big chunk of the library system. Why don't we take Kowali financial system and just put that in, or if an institution is a KFS user, you could connect them together. And so they were able to keep their money in their library mission and not spend their development dollars building the financial piece because they could reuse big parts of what was already going on. So open question to anyone on the panel, what's been your institution's reaction to this path? How, has the conversation evolved, someone shocked, somebody really had an insight. Is there some moment you might share about this at your institution? I'll go first, Brad. I think for us at UC Davis, we've been at this for quite a while. We've had some change in leadership, but I think more than anything, it's just been a quiet confidence that there has been no disruption, no calling of the vice chancellor's office or the provost's office complaining about the system not performing or, or other problems. So it's just been very calm, very quiet, very rational and kept moving and it's moved across the research side and uh, Quali Rice and someday maybe Olay, so we'll see. I would add it's been received much more favorably than I could have anticipated. The uh, enthusiasm on campus from the faculty and, and the staff has been really positive about the idea of doing something with quality. Quali, there's a, a feeling of um, a great opportunity to be working with peer institutions and really making a difference. Yeah, I'll chime in on this question one myself. Uh, we're very fortunate, an excellent group of trustees at Indiana University. They pay a lot of attention uh, to these matters and they think the path that we are on uh, of containing a lot of cost and sharing things amongst colleges and universities is just absolutely spot on. Our chair of uh, finance and audit now chair of the trustees, really very favorable towards us. Some of you who were at Kuali Days a, a couple of years back heard from President Michael McRobbie at Indiana University, and he had long been a champion that colleges and universities can share software, just as academics had before, and that we, this was an important tool for us to manage costs, get systems we need, and keep our money in our mission. Could, could any of you speak to anything you've noticed in your staff who have worked on Kowali projects? And this is a big distraction for staff who used to just run the trains at home. Mm -hmm. And if you choose to come in as an investor and help create, I'm not, we'll have many of our institutions out there that you just want to download the software or you want to work with one of the commercial affiliates who may be running it in the cloud for you. And so you're principally a consumer and paying attention to meetings like this. But everyone up here has been an investor in this software and it has required some time and energy of your staff. Could you talk about that a little bit and, and maybe something you've observed or trade-offs of that? Um, I'll take a stab at that, Brad. I think at Colorado State University, um, Actually, yes, it's added additional work to the staff, particularly when we've got new versions coming out and staff are called upon to do the testing related to the system. But the benefit that that provides to them is they become experts in the software. And they also have opportunities to collaborate with peers across the country. And they become much more versed in the language in which they're talking. And I think it's actually 
allowed them to grow so much faster in the career path or even taking a different career path that they hadn't even envisioned because the opportunities are so much broader than they were had we been relying upon a vendor to provide that service for us. Yeah, I've seen the same thing. I think our staff are far more productive, far more interested in the work that they do now compared to working on vended systems or, or other projects, and they like you know, the collaboration and working with people across the country. I can say the same thing about, about Kuali Ole. The, um, you know, a huge thank you to the staff at all of our partner institutions, and particularly to my staff at Duke who have stepped up and really taken on a lot. But I, you know, I, I hope I'm not putting words in their mouths when I say that it's been very enriching to feel that you're part of something much bigger than your own institution. Uh, I'll certainly chime in with my other hat on as the CIO at Indiana University. We were an early investor in Sakai and then I think almost all of the Kuali projects, I'll have to run the roster here, I think mm -hmm. we're, we're pretty much becoming a Kuali uh, institution as well as things with Hadi Trust in the library space and a variety of other things. We have empirical evidence now that shows the engagement in these projects for our staff. This has been professional development. We have a whole range of people who have built their careers in doing this. And over time, they learn the skill of how to manage and work with others where they have no authority. And I think everyone gets it mm -hmm. that we all have to have that tool to ourselves with managing with our uh, executive peers and trustees and, and uh, uh, other places. So building those skills of working in distributed teams of people who may see and understand things differently, where you may go into a debate thinking that you really have the way to do it. Your institution is really good at this. And in time, you realize your business process is really old school that somebody else has really thought this through a whole lot better. And learning how to manage people that come and go that are even at other universities, we have observed a whole generation of leaders arise at Indiana University, whether they're working on collaborative science projects in the research group, or teaching and learning software, or Kuali, this working together in community I view it as an essential part of our professional development because it is building great knowledge and strengths uh, in our team. The other thing, and, and maybe Lynn could speak to this, you guys were the first big institution to go early, go live. They went live in production on a version of the Kuali financial system that the foundation had not officially yet released to the public. Now, do you want to talk about the uh, insights of that? <laughs> I guess so. So Brad used a term today that being an accountant CPA that I really quite, quite resonated with, but I've never really quite associated it with this, and it was LIFO. We were last into the project and we were first out, so I, I really appreciate that, Brad. I can, I can take that home with me and, and let it sit there for a while. Um, so we after we had made the decision that we were gonna um, go with Kuali, we joined the community in 2007, but we had a board mandate to be up and running on a brand new financial system for fiscal year 10, which sounds like a little bit out there, but when you think about that, that's July 1st, 2009. We're at the end of 2007. We've got 18 months to go live on a financial system. Um, a rather daunting task as you're sitting there trying to figure it out, but I liken our move in that direction. You know those Verizon commercials where the guy walks up and he's got this whole crew of people behind him as he walks up and talks about how that's the network behind him that's supporting him? That's what Kowali is for, was for us at CSU, is we had this whole horde of higher education institutions that were behind us and moving in this direction. And that provided an awful lot of comfort for us to do that. And we were successful at coming live July 1st of 2009. Um, I happened to run into James. He's what, one of the one, three J's that I like to talk about. The period that we went live, those three weeks right before July 1st of 2009, we had one of the three J's at our campus for a week each. And they were from different institutions, I believe Cornell, Indiana, and Davis. Davis. 
And they were the ones who came and held our hand and had that Verizon network back at their campuses that they called upon to help us move forward and get through those three weeks. We were ready for an avalanche when in fact we didn't need it because although it was a branch of the system, it was a very robust and reliable system. And we moved right on through year end and up and live on Kuali and we are now closing our fourth year of being up on the system. So Successful audits. Very successful audits, yes. I think this is an important point. Now, you might pause and say, now, why would anyone of sound mind, like Mike Davis, send a staff member from Davis to CSU to help with CSU's implementation, or somebody from Indiana, or someone from Cornell? Are our budgets just in such great excess mm -hmm. that we just do that? What is the rational reason that we would send someone to help CSU go live when perhaps they could, we could have just said, you know, hey, sis, we've got commercial affiliates. Get your checkbook out. Go, 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 go talk to them. Mike, why'd you do that? I, I, I think for us is, uh, and Jonathan Keller is the person that went to uh, uh, CSU for that week-long period, but we knew that anything Jonathan did there was going to contribute back overall. So, so any, you were any, practicing on CSU. Exactly. Yeah, we were, <laughs> we were. We were using you, Lance. I'm sorry. Wow. Well, uh, now you know. <laughs> Uh, I think this is a really important point because the Koala community is founded on a value of enlightened self-interest. And so for IU or Davis or our good friends at Cornell to send and help Colorado State have a successful go live, it's in our interest for CSU to succeed because we're going to be implementing this stuff down the way. We don't need them to wobble and go badly. That's not good for us. And it enabled us to send people and help punch out bugs and find migration script issues and things and bring that knowledge back to our institutions. Now, as that has become a much more mature product, we don't need to repeat that scenario uh, over and over. But I will tell you, just by contrast, uh, this has probably been about four years ago at Indiana University. We were in the countdown to go live with a major, huge upgrade of uh, one of our big ERP modules. And we were about four weeks out, and the servers, the test servers, the test servers were spinning out of control. So they fit up, filled up disk or RAM and just pegged out. And we couldn't figure out what was wrong. So we rang up our tier one platinum support agreement, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with it either. Well, eventually, um, you know, we're about two weeks out of this thing, and this is getting really serious, maybe down to about 10 days. Finally, one of our people figured it out. It was in a Java virtual machine, an, an integration issue and, and such. And I really contrast all that we pay for that platinum support relative to the community being able to send a note amongst the community out here and say, hey, we've got an issue with this or that. I think the wisdom of crowds, and because that wisdom is sourced in our staff who have developed and learned and implemented this, uh, this stuff, this is really us, again, keeping our money in our mission in ways that achieve the outcome that we need, and that is a system that works that can be supported. I any other experience, Mike? I'd like to add, I think when we were looking at Kowali, one of the things we were struck with was that story about how people went to Colorado State to help out. And we have actually seen that in our in implementation of Kowali student, the early module curriculum management. There has been a red team that has come and visited us and a group of people that have just stepped up to make sure that's successful. And it's really this sense of community, this sense of collaboration that has brought big value yeah, and, and I can name two efforts in the last year where members of the community in different projects uh, were spinning up. They encountered some uh, uh, obstacle, which is not uncommon to implementations of big software systems. And in pretty short order, teams were put together to go visit, to sort that out. The changes and patches were committed back to the software, and it raised all boats. I mean, it really was this enlightened self-interest. So we've got just a moment left, and I'm going to go down the line one at a time, and maybe this time I'll start on this end with, with Mike. If you were to encounter someone in the hallway, and they just said, 
all right, give me the 30 seconds. What's your pitch that I should go back and talk to my leadership team of why we should do this? 30 seconds, tell me. Can't answer anything in 30 seconds. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's the future. It's the way that things are going. Early on, we heard from one of our trustees when we brought it forward to the board was nobody's buying package software anymore. That's the way of the past. And if you look at how uh, software licensing is going to the cloud to a pay by the month, pay by the service, pay by the use. If you invest in these big capital assets and then you have to transition to get the upgrade, it's a different business model and you lose some control. I think with this community, we can do great things and we can retain control and control not just over the technology and the functionality, but also over the cost. Yeah, and to unpack that just a little bit, um, the quality software, you own it. So you can run it locally, you can work with a commercial affiliate and run it in the cloud. You could take a group of institutions and put together yourself, your own cloud to run it. And I think it's important not to <coughs> contrast where the software runs on premises or off premises with the rights and control that you have, whether you are running somebody else's software that they can take away or turn off or you have the ability, should you not be in the situation you like, to move to a different provider, to take it and run it yourself. You have that option, no matter what premises the software runs on. So 30 seconds, Deborah, what's your pitch? Uh, I would say freedom, flexibility, collaboration. Libraries are very good at collaboration. They've uh, got a long history of consortial collection building, all sorts of other projects in which we share. Um, and uh, for us, uh, and for a potential uh, Olay member, I would say the flexibility, which we have not had with our commercial vendors, uh, to develop something that, that meets our needs, especially in a changing world in which we have a lot more dependence on electronic resources, and just the freedom to be a community of our own and to uh, pursue what we need. Yeah. And in Institutions of all sizes. What if you were speaking to somebody maybe from a bit smaller institution than a Colorado State? I think from a small institution perspective, the thing that I take away, regardless if I'm speaking to them or I'm speaking about Colorado State University, should resonate more with them than it does with us, and it's the word leverage. I learned new math while I was here today. I can put two in and I can get seven back. There's not any other place I can put two in and I can get seven back. And what that means is I can put two resources in and because there are partner schools that are in there, they're putting two in as well and I'm gonna end up getting the work of seven people back. And when you're a small institution, you're gonna be leveraging those who are larger than you, the Indiana, the Cornell, the Michigan State, the Hawaii, all of the partner schools that are involved in this, you're leveraging against them and you're getting their know-how and their resources that are coming back to you in the equation of two to seven. And you can't lose with that. Mike. Yeah, I think what I would say is, is about the collaboration, the community, but also the total cost of ownership. And, for, and we have a session coming up on Thursday with Michigan State and Cornell where we will share what we have spent over the years on KFS and and how that has looked, but it also has allowed us to uh, implement in a very modular approach. So we've been at this for several years, several phases, and it has not been disruptive, and it's worked really well, and that goes to the modularity of the, of the system and how easy it is to work with and how people can understand it and make it work for them. So, so I'll end with two conclusions. Uh, perhaps the greatest indicator of leadership success is that they are all still gamefully employed at the same institution. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that's the empirical uh, outcome. And the second one is, I'm on a number of different boards. Many of you are different associations and things such as that. And I want to tell you, no organization has better, no 501 organization has better financial advice than the Kowali Foundation with all of our financial people here who are involved, and Mike is the treasurer uh, of the foundation. Thank you, let's give a big hand to our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think there's no better way to talk about Kowali, uh, not in the abstract, but just in the reality of solving institutional problems, and that is fundamentally what it is about. 
I'm going to put on my hat for the foundation board. Uh, I am chairman of the board of the Kowali Foundation. We are a, a legally incorporated 501c3 with a board elected by our members and a few appointed seats. Uh, our role is fairly narrow. Many of you know that. Some of you attended Kowali 101 session uh, a moment ago in what we do. But I think this is a very important time for our community to look ahead a little bit. And in particular, for those of you who've been attending Kowali Days for some number of years, this is a particularly opportune time to think about our future. And I want to speak about the journey, the message, the means, and the outcome. The journey, the message, the means, and the outcome. So if we peer a little bit into the journey that is Kowali, Sometimes we have to be a little bit careful at these gatherings of saying, oh, I remember the conference when we had the red shirts and the green shirts, and the gold shirts didn't agree with the green shirts, and getting into a bit of a nostalgia mode. But that's part of our history. But we really are at a step function in higher education and in the evolution of these systems. So if we trace our real start to about 2004, and we look to, say, 2020-ish, that's a number I hear a lot of administrators talking about today, is how our institution will be positioned by 2020. We've gathered some really important tools along the way as a community. So we've established our values of how we do things and openness. We've learned how to collaborate, how to resolve conflicts, how to work amazingly productively with our commercial partners. We've got things that are in the United States. We have a growing involvement with institutions outside of the United States. We've got a lot of lessons learned about how you start up a project, how you balance the reality triangle and make some of those. And most importantly, we have real points on the board of achievements on campuses that are demonstrably saving money, increasing functionality, and solving problems. But as the classic book says, what got you here won't necessarily get you there. And I think it is an important time for us to think about in our community about what do we need to do? What do we need to change? What do we need to preserve? As we move from that scrappy startup that came out in August 30th of 2004 in the Chronicle of Higher Ed saying that we wanted to change the world and the cost of these big systems, to now being an organization with eight projects looking at a growing maturity of that software, seeing campuses of all sizes face economic stress unlike the, the previous decades, a changed game, how will we mature to that suite of offerings? And yes, we are now using the S word, and we were not at one point in time. Well, how will we get there? Well, part of it is in our message. Many of you who are members of the Kowali Foundation, your institutions are, and are on the Kowali All Hands list, if you're not, you should be. I think we've got about 2,000 people on the Kowali All Hands list. You saw a message from me earlier this fall talking about how we talk about what we do. So one of the things that your foundation board has been working on is how do we communicate what's going on with the Kowali Foundation? We've realized we're at a point that uh, is indicative of what Jeffrey Moore wrote in his classic book, Crossing the Chasm. And Crossing the Chasm comes from a number of, of studies, which happen to be in my PhD area, but I will save you and keep going here. Uh, Crossing the Chasm talks about uh, adoption and diffusion cycles, that there are innovators who see something interesting and they go very, very early with it. And that's what you saw with the quality financial people. Uh, I had a, an experience of going to a Big Ten CIO meeting before I was a CIO. We were building Sakai, the teaching and learning software, and I went and sat with these people the day after we announced that we wanted to build a financial system. And I was just stunned by that meeting because what they said to me essentially was, now, there, there, little Brad, if you want to build something in teaching and learning, that is amusing. But my God, this is a financial system, man. 
what are you doing? And of course, uh, you know, a financial system does have some rules about how it works where teaching and learning has 10,000 critics of what the system should be. But that early innovators jump out there and there are messages that appeal to them. Messages like, are you tired of getting a bad bill from your vendor and you just want a different way out? Or you don't like the features of this? Or did your vendor just get bought by somebody who got bought by somebody who's about to get bought? Um, you know, are there things that really appeal to you? Well, there were rallying cries. and there, Well, open source is good. Not open source is not good. And there were these messages that appealed to a certain set of, of folks. And they were essential for rallying the passion and the resources to start down this journey. But now we're really beyond many of those questions and arguments. And so what matters now is how do we communicate what this community does to the next set of early adopters? And we're a little bit in that chasm right now that a lot of uh, technology products go through. So what are the best messages for early adopters? So one of the things that we've started this year, Kuali has spent almost zero on marketing because we wanted to keep our money in our mission of building software so your money went in your mission. But what we have learned is we have to tell the story. We have to package and communicate what's going on in Kuali so when you talk to your peers in financial circles or human resources or libraries or student, they will have seen or heard of this and know what this is really about. So we just started running some Kowali choice ads. And these ran in uh, the National Association of College and University Business Officers running in their magazine. It ran in Educause's magazine, in several of our professional associations. And if you note these ads, they're very simple. Colorado State University saves millions by choosing Kowali. And that is a factual, empirically provable statement. Indiana University saves millions by choosing Kowali. And so the Colorado State ad, we have uh, Len Johnson, now the CFO, standing there with some uh, words that explain what they did. With Indiana University, I'm joined by our librarian, our associate vice uh, president for procurement, our CFO, uh, our vice president for research, our uh, associate vice provost and dean of faculty, and myself, because all of these functional people have put money into various Kowali projects. So we are, say, we are very intentionally now, because we have an accumulated body of evidence, institutions save money by putting in Kowali software. Does that mean it's free? Absolutely not. Implementation is not free. The software is without license fee, but the sharing of implementation lessons and uh, cost really has proven quite resilient. A second message that we're bringing forward now, and very appropriate, is Kowali now. There are lots of Kowali parts of software and whole projects that are ready to go. Financial is our oldest project. We will be at right at 20 institutions that are live, cut over to financial, large and small, by the end of 2013 with another wave teed up after that. Research administration, whether you're only putting in conflict of interest, or you needing to put in an interface to route grants into grants.gov or other parts of it. They are there, they are in use. Uh, so there are parts of, of these things that are out there. Students, the one I wanna speak to, and again, I will speak to, with this one with my hat on at Indiana University. I have years of student survey data saying they were not overwhelmed with their enrollment experience. Uh, using our legacy system. You know, let's just say it ain't Amazon or Chase Bank uh, uh, for an enrollment experience. And we had really reached a point we needed to do something uh, with that as well as some other things. So we are not ready to change our student system at this moment. We've got a big investment in it. It's a big change. Quality whole, every part of students not done yet. Pieces are moving along. But what we decided to do was go pick up quality modules primarily written at the University of Washington and, and with uh, other parts of the Kuali student team. So we picked up Course Search and Kuali Academic Planner, and we bolted them onto the front of our legacy Oracle PeopleSoft environment. 
and it's pretty awesome. The team did that in about eight months. And we went live with the first piece of it in July for course search for the first time ever. You can find classes far more easily than you ever could at Indiana University. And you can build an academic plan over multiple semesters of things that are going to be available. Now, we had some of that capability in our legacy system, but not in a way that students and advisors and others found easy to use. Likewise, there are parts of Kuali that uh, for workflow, routing, and eDocs that you don't need to change your HR system or your uh, student system or financial. At IU, we routed over 3 million eDocs last year that talked to legacy software, talked to homegrown systems, or talked to some Kuali. So we're starting to communicate to folks there are ways to solve today's problems right now with parts of Kuali that can be put in. So let's speak a little bit to the means of how we want to get there. And there are three areas I want to touch on. The first is a term called portfolio-ness. The second is the user experience initiative. And then I'll talk a little bit about sustaining members and the foundation itself. So we've reached that point in the TV show where it's time for me to phone a friend regarding uh, uh, portfolio-ness. And so I am going to ask uh, Eric Dina to come up and join me. Right. Good to see you, buddy. Eric is the vice chair of the Kuali Foundation Board, and he's the chief information officer at the University of Utah. Now, our origins with Kuali, as you heard from some of the panelists, and if you've been to Kuali 101 and such, we've started off with a philosophy to launch these projects that they were project big, Foundation small. So Deborah Jacobs and the librarians, one of the questions they ask, if we want to put money into building the open library environment, how do we know those darn pesky CFOs won't run off with our money for their project? So we created a fund-based accounting system, and the board of student, or the board of finance, or the board of the library, or HR, they manage their funds, they pay for some shared services, uh, and such, but each project has grown largely by the needs of its functional experts and investors. Now, Eric, you have a little bit of a background in the software industry, so mm -hmm. maybe you might tell us a little bit about that and some of what you're seeing now is you came onto the Quali Foundation board about a year ago and we quickly uh, saddled you with the work of vice chair. <laughs> I still don't know how that happened. I do. <laughs> So I, I actually started my career at Coopers and Librand after my PhD program as a Lisp programmer. Now, how many have programmed in Lisp? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, did a tour with IBM working in their financial systems uh, for a period of time with Pricewaterhouse and got involved in a bunch of startups, Whizbang Labs and Flip, excuse me, Flip Dog of, of several companies and continue to be on the board of a variety of software companies. Um, so I've kind of been around software for quite a while, 20 years. An apprentice. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, the ob so as I started getting involved in, in Kuali, um, a couple of things jumped out at me. One is the issue of growing interdependence. As soon as Kuali appropriately recognized that they were rewriting middleware as they move from financials to COEUS to whatever, um, as soon as, we, as, as the community recognized that, we began the road toward more of a portfolio, recognizing the interdependence <coughs> that rather than rewrite something over and over and over again, pulling out that piece of code and saying there's a foundation upon which we want to build all these applications. That really began the journey toward, the migration toward more of a portfolio than independent freestanding uh, projects. And, and most of our projects had their origins of making use of Kuali Rice, right. middleware. But I think folks in the projects here would say, it has always been a challenging dance of how fast Rice was moving for things that projects needed, uh, middleware stack, and how fast projects wanted to go because they needed to get some things done. So they were always in this dilemma of 
well, there's a piece of rice that's not yet done. It's something we need, so we're just going to code that ourselves okay. in the library system or the research system or such. But then rice comes with that feature set, and now we have to figure out do we, you know, retrofit to make that mm -hmm. work. So, what were you seeing then? Um, well, just just the 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 transition, the growing pains that every software organization goes through as you begin to recognize these interdependence of products, not just projects. Projects have ends. Yep. Products don't. There's a life cycle that continues on with one version after another. There's a product plan, and and, and you begin to recognize these interdependencies. One that you pointed out just recently, uh, just in in the earlier part of this session. The, the recognition by the library that we've already got a financial system. Let's not reinvent that. Let's, let's create that interconnectedness so that we take advantage of that. All of a sudden, there's that growing interdependence, not just at the foundation level, but interdependence across the products. Yeah. And one of the things that is really key to this whole argument is not making quality as a beautiful set of products that we can just say, you know, look how smart we are, but it's always about implementation back home. Yeah. How do we get these things organized in a way so that the resources that go into each of them or collectively drive down the cost of implementation and meet the needs at Utah and Indiana and Haverford and other schools around. I, I think the other thing that's emerging as, as we move forward is, and, and, and I hope all of you have a chance to, to, to visit this particular session where we're, we're recognizing the interdependence through process. This isn't just about software. It's about how we think about process, about the design of work and metrics and all those things, those interdependencies. Um, I, 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 hope you, I, I hope we all begin to develop an ability to share what we're learning about process as much as we're learning about how to share um, product, software, because the two are very interdependent. And, and we're a community of learning about best practices. Mm -hmm. And, and it's as much about process as it is about the technology. And so one of the things that we talk about with the Quality Foundation Board and the project chairs, so the chair of RICE, the chair of the library environment, the chair of human resources and all, is discussion of how we can best coordinate uh, these conflicting sometimes. They're, they're not conflicted in that we all want the same good outcomes. They're conflicting in the temporal moment of what happens first and what's the best use of, of resources. And I think this is something as Kowali goes from that startup of 2004 to that mature community that has a whole suite of things that solve institutional needs of maturing products, not just yeah. projects, that we're going to have to continue to get better at. And that's why I'm really glad we got a guy like you around. Oh. Thank you. Thanks. Now, when we talk about portfolio-ness and things like middleware and rice and things like that, um, that doesn't exactly uh, bring everybody to their knees uh, with those topics. I respect some of you, you think that's really pretty cool stuff. But there are others that say, you know, our greater concerns are not in holding some of those pieces together between and across projects, but how our users touch that software. Do they perceive that using Kowali is easy? And do they perceive that it's an outcome that is a good thing uh, for them? So about a year ago, we decided that we needed to focus more holistically on that experience. And that is uh, a project that we're calling the User Experience Initiative, or UXI. We, in, this is natural in software, you see step functions in what the technology will do at the interface level. Some of you are old enough to remember Yahoo and Google that when you started typing in a search term, nothing happened until you pressed click, okay? Now, it seems like a long time ago, but it really wasn't that long ago. Now we expect that as we start to type in something, 
that the magic of Google or Bing or whatever our choice is, it will complete that search term for us in dynamically, literally keystroke by keystroke as we're pounding that in. How do we keep the experience across Kuali software on pace with what users are experiencing from firms that compete doing this with services, again, I mentioned Chase Bank, Amazon, Wells Fargo, others who are moving very aggressively in doing this. So we decided to roll up a pool of investment, as is our custom for doing this, and to put some mind to this across multiple projects. So I'm gonna ask Jim Thomas to come up and join me. Uh, Jim is the uh, uh, Director of Business Systems at Indiana University, but to give proper introduction, uh, Jim's first Nobel Prize was as the project manager of landing the Kowali financial system and proving that could be done. Now, he looked like a man who had just been let out of jail when that had happened. <laughs> And he was going back, he was reacquainting himself with his dog, his kids were getting to know him again, and uh, he was gonna help with the implementation of that at Indiana University, and I called in my office one day and I said, Jim, we need some help on the Kowali Coeus project. Would you step in as the project manager for that? And he looked about white as a ghost uh, at that time. So he landed that project for his second Nobel Prize and, and trained another uh, good person uh, along the way in doing it. So when it was time to start thinking about the UXI initiative across multiple projects, many of which he has to run for users at Indiana University, there was that phone call of, Jim, could you come to my office, please? <laughs> and here we are. Jim, tell us a little bit about UXI. <laughs> So, okay, so Kuali UXI, bing, that's the Kuali User Experience Initiative, I think, I think is a result of the success that we've heard about today and, and the 888 people at this conference this week and the fact that Kuali has grown a great deal over the years, new software releases out, out the door all the time. And so we're starting to recognize from, from that that this user experience initiative is something very important to where we want to be in the future. And, and certainly portfolio-ness is a, is a big part of that and this idea that these applications really start to appear as a, as a suite of, of common user interfaces. And, and if you use one, uh, pretty good chance you can figure out how to use another. Um, we also want to make a concerted effort to involve users in the design process. And we've done that in some cases well, in other cases not so well. Um, but, but clearly we want to start involving in particular people like students and faculty. You know, I think it's safe to say we've done, we've probably done a better job designing for the back office user than we have for the occasional user. And so that's, that's, that's definitely something we want to do as part of the user-centered design methodology process. And then finally there's just new technology in terms of the way you deliver user interface on the web and then the bring your own device, uh, you know, the uh, iPads and mobile devices that are exploding across our campuses and everyone expecting to do just about everything using those devices. So, so these are the kinds of things that uh, Kuali User Experience Initiative um, is, is attempting to address. And so we have this, we have this term delight, well, we, we've been tossing about, and I don't know how people feel about that. I think it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty optimistic. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, I think we want to put our standards, we want to we set a, a high standard for what we want to try to accomplish. Um, and I know there's probably some of my Kuali Koyas friends out there going, I don't know how you make a proposal development budget delightful, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm going to try. And you may have a point, but I'm going to try. Um, so, so but, but the idea is we really want to make things better. We want users to appreciate the fact that they've got this system that's helping them do whatever it is that they're trying to do. Um, we want the systems to be intuitive, and, and so you think about things like Amazon and, and applications that if you are a faculty or a student, you don't necessarily use every day, and you're not necessarily an expert user, can you figure out how to use it without, um, without uh, a lot of uh, questions, calling support, whatever the case may be, reading through a manual? So one thing that I would like to start the ding on is when I hear an IT person say it's a training issue. Um, you know, I hear that, I hear that a lot, and, and I think it's one thing when you got the power user, yeah, some of, those, some of those applications really complicated, difficult to use, 
you got to have some training. I get that. But there are people that you just literally are not going to be able to provide training to there because of the numbers and, and, and basically the infrequency of which that they use those services. And so, so I sort of want to you know, get away from that idea and just start trying to think about how can we, how can we make these systems more intuitive? We also do want to look at uh, efficiency, and I think, I think this really starts to serve more to the, to the thinking about more toward the, the back office power user, but is have we built these applications to model business processes that are just, that's just the way we've always done things for 20 years, 30 years? I, I think we do that sometimes, and, and, and really sort of want to just take this user-centered design approach to, 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 to spend the time talking with, with people, understanding the business processes, and look for opportunities uh, to improve efficiency. And, and that's certainly one of our objectives. Um, there's that word delightful again. Um, but the, the bottom line is we, we really do want people to, to start to see this. It's, it's going to be an evolutionary process, right? But actually start to see this evolution in the way the quality applications start to involve users in the design process, the end result of that work starting to see uh, interfaces that are intuitive and, and easy to use and consistent across applications. Uh, that's, what we're, that's what the user experience initiative is all about. And so I can say, um, oh, I guess the last thing is that um, the responsive design and, and uh, also accessibility are, are key parts of our objectives. And so again, talking about the devices I know I look at the statistics within my applications and I can't believe the numbers in terms of the, the, the types of devices that people are starting to access and use some of those services. And some of them, I can tell you, are not a delightful experience on an iPhone. So you can go in there and you can do it and you're scrolling around and you're, you're you know, moving things and uh, uh, it's just not, not exactly what you would consider to be a delightful experience, but people are doing it. Um, and, and that's just the way they're choosing because this is the device they have with them all the time. They're not necessarily carrying the laptop around. So, so again, that's something we've got to be concerned about, get the responsive design and accessibility really built into the Kuali Rapid Application Development Framework so that all of our applications can leverage that work. So, so as I think about, Brad's right about my first response for being asked to do this UXI thing, and that's, it was probably pretty accurate. <laughs> I can but, be persuasive. <laughs> but what I think about now is, is and I'll, I'll probably mess it up, but it's this quote, it's a famous quote from Theodore Roosevelt who, who said the, the best gift in life is, is the chance to work hard at work that um, is, is worth doing. And, and I definitely think this is work worth doing, and, and I'm really excited about the opportunity. And I'm telling the truth, I am. <laughs> he is. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> you can also appreciate that the chase of improved interfaces and an ever-changing consumer marketplace of mobile devices would not make much sense if the library project had to do that on its own and the student project had to do that on its own and et cetera, et cetera. And then you had occasional users in your faculty or administrators who ended up with radically different uh, approaches for paying an invoice or approving a grant or clocking in and out in the HR system. So this is another example of portfolio-ness and this is part of a community growing up from our scrappy startups that enabled the success that you see to the organization that our campuses need, the Kuali community to be as we head towards 2020. So the third item in the means, the, the journey, the message, and the means is rethinking Kuali Foundation dues. And I share this with you as a discussion topic. Uh, we were at Cornell in the spring of 2006 at a foundation board meeting. The foundation had just been created. And we made up a scheme for dues, and we said big schools can pay about 25 grand a year. We had one CIO who could not approve 25 grand, that that had to go to another process. But he could approve 24-5. So <laughs> the top tier of the due structure was created at 24-5 for an unnamed but highly successful CIO, I might add. Uh, small schools were set at $4,500, and this is based on total receipts uh, to your universities. Uh, KCA, do I hear a ding? 
quality commercial affiliates. Uh, those commercial firms that want to be members of the foundation, they were set at 20,000. And here you see the foundation itself runs on about $1.2 million a year. Uh, and we've done a heck of a lot on a due structure that has not been touched since 2006. And I think Jennifer and her team deserve tremendous credit. Um, she's incredibly frugal, I can tell you that as I try to get things from her. So looking ahead, your foundation board is considering three questions. What are the right level of dues for the foundation? And let me be clear. The, if you become an investor in the HR project or in student, that money goes into the project and it's paid for, for development and good outcomes for that project and that project may pay for some shared services. The money that you pay to the Quali Foundation enables events like this, enables that we have a really rigorous financial tracking, that your money is audited, the five staff at the Quali Foundation. It pays for a very small set of things and an organization that by financials last year has 30 million in net assets. If you count all the software development commitments and contracts we have, which you do by proper accounting uh, procedure. So it's time to reevaluate the right level of dues and probably to set those dues on a small path of a couple percent a year just to track with inflation and costs rather than having step function changes. So that's something your foundation is looking at. How should they change over time? And I think the third one really goes back to invoking what I said from the beginning. This is a community that has learned a lot and we have established some values that work for us over time. One of our values that we say in some jest but in some seriousness is that we follow the golden rule, that those who bring the gold make the rules. And there's a reason for that because when you put uh, money in and you want to have influence, you don't necessarily want your money being vetoed by someone who maybe is not contributing. Uh, in any way. So how will we fund this ongoing work that we need acceleration for UXI and greater portfolio-ness? And we think one of the means of doing that would be to honor the quality values. Should a place like Indiana University or Cornell or some of these others who are very big recipients of value when this stuff integrates better, when it's uh, been polished a bit more, should we establish some means of a sustaining member of the foundation? Now, in the money we're thinking about, it's all still small potatoes by comparison to what we would pay for any other kind of commercial contracts out there. But would members who pay some increment over their normal foundation dues, would they want to then help prioritize portfolio -ness investments over time? Projects would focus really on their needs and outcomes and portfolio investors could help shape and provide some of that extra resources that are needed to sew these things together. These are questions on the mind of your foundation board and you'll be hearing more from me and, and others over the next year as we think about how we evolve in the means. So the journey, the message, the means, and the outcome. And the outcome that we strive for is simple. We have only one master to serve, and that is our colleges and university members who need to keep their money in their mission. So with that, I thank you for this morning's session. Do we have some further guidance for these folks? Okay, a quick closing to pass, and I'm going to personally put in a plug tonight for the community showcase. You do not want to miss that. It is where you see the latest and greatest and talk to all the folks who are doing lots of the projects in uh, the Kuala community. With that, back to our chair. All right, so we'll be sending you on your way soon to start, start, start attending sessions and collaborating with the other colleagues. Um, but I want to remind everybody to attend the closing luncheon on Thursday. We have some exciting things planned for the event, and you won't want to miss those. Um, I also want to encourage you to um, take it all in while you're here. Ask questions, collaborate with your colleagues from other schools, make new connections, and remember to have some fun along the way. Check out the beaches. Um, check out the nightlife. There's a lot going on out there. Try to see some of the sights. But most important, learn all you can about Kuali. We're building momentum through community.